the plan for today, we are going to be looking at how to detect extra dimensions and if they exist uh, and what, how we might infer their presence. Uh, the same caveats apply in that this is mostly for memory, although I did do a little bit of research today just to kind of see what the state of the art was because I knew that the group that I'm particularly going to be focusing on had another experiment in their wings and it is, has in fact been published, the results from that experiment. So that is the plan. Uh, to how do you look for extra spatial dimensions and what's the theory that would predict their existence and so forth. All right, and I will do the best that I can in reproducing um, the results properly, but uh, I'm as human as the next person. Okay, here we go. If you had, okay, let, uh, starting a little bit further back, gravity. Gravity follows the inverse square law. And this... I got a new keyboard and it's got a cord on it and so it's getting in the way of my drawing pad. All right, gravity follows the inverse square law, right? So the force of gravity is equal to g m m over r squared, this right here. Uh, this is a consequence, the scaling of this r squared is a consequence of the fact that we live in three large spatial dimensions. So when you have a object, a gravitating object here, um, it's going to emit a field that goes out in all directions. It would actually, because it's gravity, it would be pointing the opposite way because gravity is always attractive because of the nature of the coupling between the graviton, if the graviton really exists. But uh, anyways, the nature of the coupling is such that um, gravity is always attractive. So the force of gravity, because we live in three spatial dimensions, you're going to have equal force in all these different places. Uh, you apply Gauss's law to basically say that um, the strength of the gravitational force is going to be uniform if you add it up across an entire surface area. Um, and well, that, that's the main thing, is that you have a surface. So here's this surface uh, that's out at some distance, and you have all this uh, gravitational force that's pulling in, and that the gravitational force is, uh, the strength of the gravitational force decays as the surface area, so that when you multiply the surface area times the gravitational force, you get a constant. That's what it basically boils down to. Uh, that if you, you have a surface area, the surface area squiggles r squared, and you have a force that squiggles one over r squared, so when you multiply the surface area times the force, you get a constant, uh, and that, that's basically Gauss's law. So if we lived in a higher dimensional universe, let's say that there were four spatial dimensions instead of three, uh, then the force of gravity, using the same approach, would be g m m over r cubed. And because you would have now the surface area, is the surface area is one dimension lower than the volume. So if you have a four-dimensional universe, a uh, four-spatial dimension universe, then the volume will, or then the surface area would be three-dimensional, and the force of gravity would fall off as one over r cubed instead of one over r squared. So this is a nat a consequence of the fact that we live in three large spatial dimensions. However, spatial dimensions don't always have to be large. And in particular, uh, string theory predicts, well, and other things. It's not just string theory. There's other ways to do this. Uh, but you might have more spatial dimensions than what we observe. You might have spatial dimensions that are on very small scales that we just haven't been able to see yet. So while we might have three large spatial dimensions, it's possible that one of those spatial dimensions, so if we, if we have uh, let's pretend that this is one of our spatial dimensions right here. Uh, we'll call it uh, what? We'll call it the x direction. So the x direction is in that way, and it looks like it's a large, simple spatial dimension. But if you zoom in on any point of this and you kind of blow it up, then you might end up with some kind of thing like this, where yes, you have the overall x direction that looks like that, but you might also have this direction, which we will call what am I going to call it? I'll call it phi for no good reason. Uh, so phi would be the dimension that is around this way. So that maybe each spatial dimension at a given point is going to have uh, other spatial dimensions that are really, really small. Like really, really small, small enough that we haven't been able to see them yet. Um, and so, you know, this would be phi. And in a given point in space, so you have this x direction, you'll also have a y direction associated with it. And that y direction might itself have you know, some compactified dimension that's associated with it. In this case, it wouldn't be theta anymore, it'd be phi. Uh, although I guess the, the fact that the universe, you can rotate in any direction um, and 
conserve angular momentum might imply that this is supposed to be the same thing as that. Nevertheless, the point being that um, you can have, like I should say that the size of this dimension would be the size of this dimension. And here size meaning the radius of whatever this extra dimension happens to be. So that in every, in every point in space, you might have some small surface that's also a spatial surface, but it's a compactified one, meaning that it doesn't extend out to infinity. It has some length scale associated with it, and the whole dimension is bound up in that length scale. So that is the idea of like compactified extra dimensions, is that at a given point in space, you not only have x, y, and z, the three different spatial dimensions, but you also can have smaller spatial dimensions um, that don't extend out to infinity, but are instead bounded by some size um, we'll call it R for lack of a better size. So <clears throat> these large spatial dimensions imply things for the way that forces would behave in this higher dimensional space. In particular, if you look at, here's your gravitating object, it's going to have, uh, I'm going to put draw these arrows outwards because it, it's a little bit, I already did it. Um, so you have gravity, or it could be the electromagnetic charge, but we're talking, gravity is what we're talking about because gravity goes through space. Um, gravity is the distortions of space uh, as opposed to uh, electromagnetism, which is a is, is a fluctuation in the electromagnetic field. This is gravity is space, right? That's what at least what Einstein tells us. So this uh, the force coming off of a gravitating object, the gravitational field coming off a gravitating object is going to exert a force that is one over r squared. Uh, however, if you um, if you zoom in on this and you actually have that one of the dimensions has an extra, an extra dimension associated with it, a compactified dimension associated with it, that means that, okay, on very, this arrow right here might be along this direction, so that that's the gravitational field propagating in some direction. But you also have that at a given point in space, the gravity is going to spread out um, around and wrap around um, this compactified dimension so that you know the gravitational force is going to be going also in this extra direction so that implies that if you're right next to it once you get down uh, so here's the size r once you're probing the gravitational force at distances smaller than this compactified spatial dimension size then the strength of gravity will behave differently so instead of falling off as 1 over r squared it will fall off as 1 the force of gravity will squiggle 1 over r to the number of dimensions minus one. So one over r squared in a three-dimensional universe and one over r to the d minus one. If we live in a 10-dimensional universe, then it will be one over r to the ninth. And that will be related to, and that, that's if you're talking about you know, some scale that's like this size. Uh, it will change, you'll go through a transition when you get much bigger than r, or as, as you pass r as the, you know, the size that you're probing because you know, these things get wrapped around a little bit and so the the force is going to be a little bit, it's going to change as it transitions from this 1 over r to the ninth, well, 1 over r to whatever, uh, d minus 1 to 1 over r squared. So that is uh, what one would look for. So the idea would be you conduct a gravitational experiment. You have some kind of gravity probe, and you probe the behavior of gravity at shorter and shorter and shorter distances. So that maybe if there is some compactified extra dimension that's really tiny that we haven't been able to observe before, that you would see a change in the inverse square law. So instead of the force falling as 1 over r squared, it falls as 1 over some r to something else. And that would imply there's another spatial dimension, and uh, you'd, you'd win. Like, you'd win the universe, uh, because it would be the discovery of new spatial dimensions and with all that that implies. So how does one do this? Well, of course, when you're doing gravity experiments, you're looking for something that is, you know, you're looking at something that's the strength of gravity, basically, uh, because it's the gravitational field. And so you need to have something that's very good at probing gravity, and that is, you guessed it, a torsion pendulum. You'd want to have a torsion pendulum because that is an extremely sensitive instrument uh, in order to probe these gravitational things. There are other things that are done. There's interferometry. Um, that can be done, and we'll see some examples of that on uh, the stuff I'm going to show you. So this was first, uh, there was a paper that was published in the early 2000s um, where they proposed that if you had two extra dimensions, 
Uh, so plus two dimensions. That says dimensions. Uh, so that'd be a five spatial dimensions, two compactified dimensions, and one other dimension. That the length scale of this would be something on the order of one millimeter. The, roughly the size of these spatial dimensions through some natural um, thing like, oh, I'm just going to pull numbers, fundamental constants out, and um, combine them in such a way that I get something, you know, some extra dimensions. You get roughly one millimeter scale. Another thing that came out around the same time, so this would have been 1998, as opposed to like 2001 or whatever to the whenever that paper came out uh, so in 1998 was the discovery of dark energy um, so with dark energy you have uh, a length scale associated with dark energy which is what is the energy density of dark energy so now we have to do a little bit of particle physics unit analysis here when particle physicists talk about energy uh, or length or time time squiggles one over energy Okay, so frequency, that means frequency squiggles energy, squiggles energy. So the higher the frequency something is, the more energy it has. So that makes sense. And frequency is one over time. Uh, lengths are also squiggle one over energy. Okay, so uh, when you have high energy stuff, you're talking short wavelength things, which means short length scales. And the conversion between energy and length, you have to like scratch your head a little bit. And then you have this thing, H bar C, which is uh, what? Well, I, I learned it as HC without the bar, um, which is 1240 EV nanometers. That's, a, that's an N, by the way, and there's an M. So 1240 EV nanometers. So basically this just says, okay, I have an energy, I convert the energy to electron volts, I divide by this thing, and I'm left with a nanometer, I'm left with a length. So, but the point being that lengths squiggle one over energy as well. So when you're talking high energy, you're talking short lengths. Okay, what does this mean? So if you have an energy density, what does it look like? If you have an energy density, it would be energy divided by length cubed, which is energy divided by one over energy, it squiggles, squiggles here, uh, one over energy cubed, which is energy to the fourth power. Or to put it another way, because that's not really what I meant to do, I did it exactly backwards of what I wanted to do. If I reconvert this to lengths, uh, this is gonna squiggle one over length to the fourth. Okay, one over, that's an L, one over length to the fourth. So an energy density is energy to the fourth power or a one over length to the fourth, if you do the unit analysis. Now, why would one somebody want to do a unit analysis? Well, the answer to that question is we've measured the energy density of the universe. We know that the dark energy density of the universe is something on the order of uh, milli EV to the fourth. Okay, milli EV to the fourth. So that's this thing right here is roughly the energy density, it's like 0.7 milli EV to the fourth, something like that, is, is, that's lambda, that's the energy density of the universe, the dark energy density. And so when you convert this using that 12, the H and C's and stuff like that, you get a number that is also roughly one millimeter in length. A millimeter length scale is also the dark energy scale uh, for the energy density of the universe. So there's two reasons, those are two reasons why one might consider the millimeter length scale as an interesting thing to probe to look for interesting gravitational signatures, signatures of gravity. Okay, so we have maybe there's compactified extra dimensions and maybe the dark energy density, uh, because dark energy is roughly gravitational strength, we know the energy density, and so let's look for gravitational forces on the length scale of a millimeter um, because that coincides with uh, what we observe in the universe. Okay, so how does one do this? Uh, well, okay, I mentioned that it was a torsion pendulum. So they designed uh, dark energy gravity. So this would be, it's not that dark energy alone is gravity, it's that the strength of the dark energy coupling, like how much influence dark energy has, is gravitational strength. It's roughly the same uh, strength that gravity is. Because, you know, dark matter is 30% and dark energy is uh, something else. So you would look for something that is roughly gravitational coupling because it affects the universe on roughly the same energy scale or the same strength uh, as gravitational influence does. So that, that's why uh, one would do an experiment looking for gravitational strength deviations from, or gravitational strength anomalies uh, at a millimeter scale because it might be related to dark energy. Okay, so uh, what you need to do then is design some kind of experiment, some kind of torsion pendulum experiment like this, 
Okay, where you have, here's this torsion pendulum, you have this thin fiber that makes it so that it's, it responds to very, very weak forces. Uh, you need a, a really thin fiber, fiber, like 10 microns or something like that, um, because that very, very weak forces will call a def cause a deflection. You'd put a mirror on this, you would shine a laser beam off of it, and you look for a deflection. Um, and then what you need is your masses here on these two sides. So this is a fiber, here's your pendulum. These are masses made out of whatever they happen to be made out of. I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. And then you're going to have these masses next to it that it's attracted to. So here's another source mass type thing on both sides. So these things are going to be attracted to each other. So they're going to, they're going to, there's going to be an attraction there. There's going to be an attraction here. Um, and if you can get them to within a millimeter of each other, then that would tell you, you know, you'd be able to probe whether they are, they agree with Newton's prescription or if there's some extra force. Uh, or some dilution of the force. Maybe the force gets weaker. The force to get weaker if it gets diluted, if the gravitational force gets diluted into more dimensions, um, that would actually imply that the force probably gets stronger, right? Because you've already lost those other dimensions. Um, so you have gravity coming out this way, and then now you see gravity coming out in a different dimension. It's Well, it scales differently. So as you bring it closer together, then you would see the, the strength of the gravitational field changing. Did it get stronger? I think it would get stronger because you have more lines. Um, so gravity should get stronger as you go to higher dimensions. Um, yes, more midi chlorines is exactly what you're looking for. So you need to come down, and the separation here needs to be on the order of a millimeter. And you would test it at a variety of different length scales just to show, okay, gravity's working, gravity's working, gravity's working, as you get closer and closer, and then all of a sudden, or then you go through a transition, now gravity's not working, gravity's not working, the way that it was, it's predicted by Newton or Einstein. Uh, this is all weak field gravity, so you don't have to worry about relativity so much. Um, it's just Newton's gravity works just as well. Okay, so that's what you would do. But the problem is when you have a big floppy pendulum like this, there's going to be all sorts of issues that you run into um, in terms of systematic effects and how do you control for vibrations in this and how do you control this thing so it doesn't flop around too much. Uh, so you wouldn't design... This is the basic idea, but you need to design something that where you can control things and you can make calibration measurements in real time. You want to be able to calibrate your measurements uh, as you're taking data so that you can say, oh, well, we see that there's this effect that's coming in. It shows up in um, a signal that we receive automatically that is not directly related to the signal that we're actually looking for. So here is how that pendulum was designed. I'm going to steal this from their publication. Uh, okay, so I thought I was going to steal it from their publication. It must be on this one. That is, is this the right one? This is the right one. So this is the 2006 uh, publication in Physical Review Letters. I think it's, yeah, Physical Review Letters, which is uh, probably my favorite. Uh, I just need to get it the right size. Let me pull this one back up. So that's the size I'm going for. It's down here a little bit. Can lower, there we go. So physical review letters. We're going to hide these thumbnails if I can. I don't know if I can. Yeah, there we go. So everybody likes physical review letters. And, and this is back when physical review letters was uh, was really did, really did it the cool way in that you only had four pages. You have four pages to say what you're going to say, and that's it. And that includes all the references. So this is, uh, you have to write very good prose uh, from early, or from this era in physical review letters. Now you get extra space. You can put, um, you can spill onto a fifth page because it's electronic, and so we don't have to worry about conserving paper and so forth. But uh, back then, you had to fit everything into four pages. Meant that you had to write pristine language. Okay, so here is the design of their apparatus. It looks like this. Uh, this was from back in the day. Okay, it's five centimeters. It's only two inches tall. Right? It's it's a little a little thing. About like yay. And you can see that it has these holes drilled into it. It's uh, Here's the suspension fiber. Comes down, you have these uh, beads up here, they're metal balls. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Comes down like that, and then you have a plate. That plate has these holes drilled into it. Uh, there are 21 of them. Uh, 21, right? I think they, they may have had two different uh, experiments. No. Or 
or seven to the same shoes as that. Twenty-one. Okay, yeah. So it's twenty-one fold symmetry, and then what they say is forty-two test bodies. Um, this is. So it's 21 as you go around, and there are 42 holes that are drilled into it. Now, why do they drill these holes? The idea here is that they're going to spin uh, the plate on the bottom. So here's this plate down here at the bottom. They're going to spin that on a turntable. And as they spin it, when the holes are not aligned with each other, there's going to be a gravi an extra gravitational attraction that's going to cause the pendulum, the suspended thing, to twist in a particular way. And then once as the thing keeps spinning then it's going to go back and then it keeps spinning and it's going to twist again and it's going to keep spinning and it's going to go back so let me show you give an idea of what that's going to look like okay so here is the the source mass the the thing that's on the rotating pendulum let's say that you have uh let's just do four holes as an example so you have four holes and then you have another pendulum that you're going to set down on top of this that also has four essentially matching holes. Okay, when the holes are aligned like this, okay, so the dotted ones are going to be the holes from the suspended pendulum. The dotted ones are going to be these, no, not those. The bottom ones are going to be these holes that are up, I'm sorry, the dotted, dotted, are going to be the holes that are on the pendulum itself. So that's these ones here that are attached to this fiber. The solid holes are going to be the ones that correspond to the base. So back to the drawing pad. When it's aligned like this, you'll notice that the, uh, the mass of the pendulum is over the hole of the substrate or of the platform. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not two pendulums, it's one source mass on a turntable and a single pendulum that's sticking down. It's actually a balance because they don't oscillate it, um, but balance pendulum, it's all the same. <clears throat> so in this case, what you're going to have is that the portion, uh, let me see if I can, the portion of the pendulum that has, ex that has mass, so there's not a hole there, the portion of the pendulum that has mass is going to be attracted to the portion of the substrate that has mass. So let me see if I can come up with a better way to draw this. This is not a very good, not a very good drawing. Okay, let me, so here's a wedge. Here's a wedge, and let's say that there's a hole here and a hole here. So that, they, that, that okay, so there's two holes. So it looks like that. And here is a, the wedge from the pendulum itself. So here's another wedge. Uh, and these are going to get really close together, right? Because they're going to get down to less than a millimeter apart. If the holes are lined up, if the holes of the pendulum are lined up with the holes of the platform of the turntable, then you have extra mass here. So there's mass here. This is extra mass because there's a lack of holes. And there's extra mass here also because of a lack of holes. And so there's going to be a stronger gravitational attraction between this mass here and the mass here. Okay. If, on the other hand, uh, a little bit later you have, so here's the wedge of the turntable. So the turntable is going to rotate. So now let's rotate the turntable. So the turntable looks like this. The pendulum itself is going to still be suspended. So here's a wedge of the pendulum. And the wedge of the pendulum is still going to have holes like this and holes like that. And so here is, again, the lack of holes. There's extra material. The extra material is dark. But now this extra material is above the lack of material in the substrate. And so it's actually going to feel a stronger gravitational attraction over here where there's extra material there, or over here where there's extra material here. Okay, so there's extra material in between the holes on both of these, and so the extra material in the pendulum is gonna be attracted to the extra material in the turntable, so the bottom plate. So there's the strongest attraction is here, and it's gonna feel this torque that's pulling it towards one side or the other. And as it rotates, as the turntable rotates, it's gonna be attracted towards the one that's gonna be incoming, the one that's getting closer to it. And that's going to cause the fact that there's this extra attraction between the pendulum and the turntable is going to cause this thing to twist in the direction that the turntable is coming from. And it's going to twist it until they kind of line up and then it's going to follow it as it moves across, as it moves through this configuration. And it's, uh, then as it keeps turning, it's going to see the next lack of holes, the next extra mass, and it's going to be pulled back towards it. So as the turntable rotates, so the turntable, let me see if I can do this with amazing um, 
with if I just switch to the camera. Whoa, that's uh, not the transition I was expecting to see, but hey, it's always it's beautiful because of my amazing H logo. Uh, okay, so now that we see just the transition or just the camera, and I'm going to hide my desk. Try to hide my desk. Okay, so you have the pendulum kind of looks like this. It's got holes in it. It's got mass in it. Um, as the turntable sweeps underneath like that, the pendulum is going to oscillate. They're not very good oscillations. The pendulum is going to oscillate. The turntable sweeping, and it's going to try to line up, and then it's going to break, and then it's going to try to line up. Wow. Okay. So here's this. Here's this pendulum sweeping through, and it's going to try to line up. And as it continues to sweep through, it's going to go like that, and then it's going to switch and line up with the next one. And it's going to follow, and then it's going to switch and line up with the next one. And so as the turntable rotates, wow, this is, I'm not doing a very good job, but as the turntable rotates, the pendulum is going to sit there and oscillate back and forth between being attracted when the things line up. There's a lot of attraction. It's going to twist, and then it's going to go and line up with the next one. And then it's going to twist some more, and then it's going to line up with the next one. And so it's going to, the turntable is going to rotate at some rate, but the oscillation of the pendulum, the oscillation of the balance, is going to happen at a rate that is 21 times faster. Uh, why 21 times faster? I'm glad you asked. It's 21 times faster because you have 21 times the number of holes. So there's a 21-fold symmetry. So you rotate this thing at like once per minute. You rotate the turntable once per minute the pendulum itself is going to oscillate 21 times per minute as it as these holes um, and lack of holes pass by each other. So that is what's um, what they're looking for is that's where the attraction is going to be. So they can rotate the turntable at some rate and then the signal that they see is going to be 20 time, 21 times that rate and then they can drop the pendulum closer and closer and closer to the turntable and see if the strength of that uh, of the force between the pendulum and the turntable grows as one over r squared, the way that it was, the way that it's predicted from Newton's laws. Uh, it's done in a vacuum. Yes, it has to be done in a vacuum. So they have this pendulum suspended in a vacuum chamber with all sorts of apparatus up above it. It's got like vibration dampers. It's got um, the pendulum itself is gold coated. You don't see it here, but I can probably find. Should be able to find the image. Uh, let's go at wash. Uh, pendulum. It's uh, th okay. This was an earlier version of it, so this one had like what nine-fold symmetry or something like that, as opposed to the twenty-one-fold. So that was an improvement. Is this it? Yeah, that looks like. So this is the this is the real deal. I just want to see the apparatus. Okay, here's the apparatus. Okay, so you can see these holes that are drilled there. Um, you can see, I'll talk about what these are. Notice that the surface here, um, it's all gold colored. The reason it's gold colored is because these are very, very weak forces. Gravity is a very, very weak force compared to the electromagnetic force. So the electromagnetic force, me using the electromagnetic force to propel myself up into the air whenever I jump into the air for joy at studying gravity or exoplanets. I jump into the air for joy and my self, my weak human self, can overcome the strength of an entire planet, the gravitational strength of an entire planet, just with the electromagnetic force that I generate between my feet and the surface of the Earth. So electromagnetic forces, big time problem. They are way, way stronger than the gravitational force. So you coat it in gold because if there's any stray electron um, from static electricity or from cosmic rays uh, producing whatever, ionizing something, uh, you want those electrons to be able to drain away from that up the fiber and out to ground. So it has to be totally electrically neutral. The way to do that is you coat it in gold, which is a good electric conductor. Um, so this is an image of that pendulum. Remember that it's just two inches across in all these different things. The flat surfaces that you see here, uh, so it's a cylindrical surface and then you have flat surfaces, that's where they reflect the laser beam. So they use a laser beam um, bouncing off of the, um, the surfaces in order to measure the rotation, like the, the twisting of this balance as the turntable rotates underneath it. Uh, so the turntable, ro turntable rotates underneath it, you have a laser beam shining off of that. That laser, as the pendulum kind of swishes around, 
the laser beam spot is going to move and that shows up in your detector and that's how you make your measurement. Okay, uh, for the, now, these three balls that are up on top, those are an extra calibration. Uh, what they have is outside of the apparatus, they have three more gigantic balls. Well, gigantic meaning probably about this big. I haven't seen them myself, but they're probably, they have to be big enough to induce a force. Um, but they have those uh, out in the exterior so that these uh, trim masses or calibration masses are going to be attracted to those three other masses. And so you get another signal. So as you turn the turntable, you get an, another signal where these three are going to be attracted to three external masses. And so, but now instead of having an oscillation that happens at 21 times the rotation frequency, you have a second signal that's a calibration signal that happens at three times the turntable rotation frequency. Um, and that allows you to you know, measure the effects of if there's a truck that drives by and distorts things. And so it will show the distortion of the external gravitational field um, will show up by through these calibration masses. And that's a way, as you measure the external field because of these calibration masses, it allows you to correct for how those things would creep into the signal that you're looking for at 21 times the rotation frequency. Um, so, and it's suspended inside of a vacuum chamber. So they have this cylinder that's a vacuum chamber. The vacuum chamber is gonna have windows that they can shine the laser beam in, uh, but it, all the air has to be totally removed. I mean, air is like way, way bigger deal. Um, these are tiny, tiny forces. To give you an idea of the strength of the force that they're looking at here, um, you can take a pin. So you take a pin, take my amazing pizza slice thing. You take a pin like this, and it's over here, and here's the head of the pin. And you take a postage stamp. So here is a postage stamp that you just tore out of the booklet. Of course, they don't tear stamps out of the booklet. You kind of unstick them. But back in the day, you could uh, you'd have postage stamps that you tore and you take this thing and you divide it up into one billion pieces so now you have one one billionth of a postage stamp and you take this postage stamp and you place it right here so there's your postage stamps one billionth of a postage stamp sitting on the pin the head of a needle and this torsion pendulum would be able to feel the force exerted on it that's how sensitive we're talking about these torsion pendula are like uber sensitive. It's, it's amazing to contemplate the sensitivity of these kinds of devices. So it's in a vacuum. Uh, they have to do temperature control because as the temperature changes, um, the elastic properties of the fiber change. Uh, the thermal properties change because there's thermal noise um, just from random motions of things like that. So they have to control the temperature very, very precisely. Uh, they don't necessarily have to go cryogenic, right? They don't have to necessarily go down to 4 Kelvin or something like that to remove the noise, but rather they have to pick a temperature and operate at that temperature. And I believe that they were maintained the temperature, I don't know about this current experiment, but the or, or this previous experiment, but I think the current experiment, they were able to control the temperature within like 5 millikelvin. Um, so very stable temperature environment, because if you don't, then the elastic properties change and then that's gonna cause all sorts of systematic things that, to creep in. Another thing that you have to deal with is that you're bringing these two conducting plates because they're both covered in gold to get rid of all the electric charges, you bring these two conducting plates close together. And so um, you can develop like capacitance problems where um, you're basically making a capacitor out of it uh, and stray electric charges might coalesce along the surface and so you have to um, deal with also stray magnetic fields. If you have, it's made out of metal, so you have this metallic domain. Maybe you have a little iron, imperfe some imperfections because there's iron that you weren't able to extract from the gold um, or iron that you weren't able to extract from the, uh, was it beryllium copper or something like that? But we can see what it's made out of. And so any small iron filings or iron atoms that are left in there, you know, we're talking like parts per trillion, um, that's a little magnet. And there's a magnet magnetic field from the earth, there's a magnetic field from the medical school, there's a magnetic field from wherever, these extra magnetic fields are gonna come in here. And so you have to surround it by cages that eliminate radio frequency interference, right? You have oscillating radio waves that are coming in, um, messing around with these atoms that can cause problems. So you have to deal with radio frequency interference, you have to deal with uh, stray magnetic fields that are coming in, you put it in a mu metal box that eliminates uh, these extra magnetic fields. So, um, so all of these things you have to address 
one of the things they do is they have a, basically a piece of foil. It's like tin foil, except it's not made out of tin. Um, they put a foil in between them to mitigate some of those effects uh, between the turntable and the pendulum mass. So let's go back to this here. So that's the diagram. They don't show the foil. They do show the, the surfaces here. They see the, the trim masses or the calibration masses and then this thin fiber. I'm not totally sure. Um, they, don't, they don't show the electrical system with the, they mentioned. The three small spheres at the top were used for continuous gravitational calibration um, and so forth. So now in terms of like hugeness, the, the thing here is that gravity, the strength of the gravitational force depends upon the mass. So you want to have like dense materials um, at a large enough scale so that your signal is large enough that you can see it. And so that's why you go to metals. So you make it out of metals because metals are the most dense thing that we have. Um, and you, you're going to have noise from ambient environment. So this is, you know, four inches square. It's about the size of maybe the size of a tennis ball. Um, you want to have the mass to be big enough so that the environmental stuff, you know, even though you're in a vacuum, there's still air molecules in the vacuum. You can't get a perfect vacuum. So you can try. Uh, so you have the vacuum, you still have air molecules bouncing around. So if you want to measure a weak force, you do have to contend with the fact that there is going to be some leftover, um, leftover gas in your vacuum chamber. Another thing you're going to run into is that the laser beam is bouncing off of this mirror. And so the mirror actually is going to heat up a little bit because there's going to be a little absorption. Even though the laser beam might reflect at 99.99%, uh, there's going to be 0.01% absorption. That 0.01% absorption means a number of things. One of the things that that means is that you have a stray air molecule coming in. It's going to bounce off the side where the laser beam is hitting, and it's going to recoil with slightly more energy than it would off of a port part where the laser beam is not hitting. And so I don't know if, if they did this in this particular experiment, but in the experiment I was on, uh, we had laser beams shining in to the apparatus from a variety of different directions, basically to keep all of the mirrors at the same temperature. Because um, any slight difference in temperature is going to cause a difference in the recoil velocity of the ambient air that's remaining in the vacuum chamber. So uh, you have to account for a lot of systematic effects. So you need to have something big enough so that it doesn't uh, it responds only weakly to those kinds of effects. Um, but you don't want to have it so big. The, the other issue that you run into is that you have to machine this. And so when you machine it, you're going to have imperfections in the surface. And those imperfections, the number of imperfections you're going to have is proportional to the surface area because you, know, you can only machine things so well. So the more surface you have to machine, that you, know, you have twice the surface you have to machine, that's going to mean twice the number of surface imperfections. And so you want to minimize the surface area. Uh, while simultaneously maximizing your signal. So a dish is not really something that minimizes the surface area, but your signal is down there at that level. So in general, you want to minimize the surface area, um, or at least the machined surface area, and maximize the mass. Uh, and also, um, and then minim so all of these things are competing against each other, which kind of drives you to the, like, what can you control? How big is your vacuum chamber? How good of a vacuum can you draw in your chamber? Um, how quickly can you cool it? How quickly can charges and stuff like that leave your system? What room do you have to operate in? So all those things go into the design of the pendulum. Okay, so they make these measurements looking for, here's their turntable frequency, and then this is their noise. So you can see their noise. Um, the signal frequency is uh, this red one. So let's see what happens. There's something going on here. Fourier transform of the raw twist signal. So this is the raw twist signal. So you can see they have noise. You can see that you know there's some noise that it's interfering with their system because you can't get rid of it, right? We live in a universe with stuff in it. Uh, the detector's free resonance occurs at 7.5 times the oscillation frequency. So they can measure the oscillation frequency. The pendulum itself is going to prefer to oscillate um, at some frequency. And you want to um, move that you don't want the oscillation frequency, you don't want to amplify the oscillation, the natural oscillation of the pendulum. Well, in some cases you do. In this particular instance, they don't. In this particular instance, they know how the pendulum will want to oscillate if it's left to its own devices, and they chose a signal frequency that was different than that oscillation frequency. Uh, I worked on an experiment where they deliberately tried to uh, excite the pendulum oscillation at the oscillation frequency of the pendulum. In this case, they, they don't want to mess with the oscillation frequency of the pendulum. Uh, so they run it 
at a signal that is different from the actual oscillation frequency. The so the detector's free resonance occurs at 7.5 times the, the frequency of the, um, the, the turntable rotates. The gravitational calibration is at nine times that frequency, nine times because you have three of them. Um, and the peaks at 21, 42, and 63 times uh, probe the inverse square law. So 21, 42, and 63, why those three numbers? It's because you have 21-fold symmetry in your pendulum. So you're gonna have 21, some, a signal at 21 times, you're gonna have a signal at twice that uh, frequency because um, whenever you get one, you're gonna get the higher order modes that go along with it, and 63 is the third order mode that goes along with it. Just like if you have a vibrating string, you're gonna have the first harmonic, the second harmonic, and the third harmonic that are all excited in that string. The same thing's going on here. You're gonna have the fundamental frequency and its harmonics, and they're going to only consider uh, the frequencies at um, 21, 42, and 63 to probe the inverse square law. So the smooth curve shows the thermal noise level. So that's this, that's from their thermal noise measurements. Uh, at the small separation, the torque noise power retains the expected one over F form. So that's this slope right here um, and exceeds the thermal value by a, a factor of four. So that's the limit that they have in their sensitivity is how much above, like how much noise there is in the, in the signal. So the moral of the story is everything basically behaved the way that they expected it to be, and they did not see an errant signal. They did not see some universe-provided um, extra gravitational signal. So they were able to place constraints on the presence of new forces. So here's their separation. So here's, uh, as you change the separation on this axis, so you're starting at 10 millimeters and you're going to one millimeter. One millimeter was interesting because that's the length scale of this extra spatial dimension. It's also the length scale of uh, what we got from the dark energy density. And as you go to smaller and smaller length scales, um, these are the data that they took, like deviations from the inverse square law as you get smaller and smaller length scales. They do have some points that were errant. They have large error bars, but they, those points exist. And so the constraint that they can place is basically what's the best you can do, and that's this uh, line right here, this solid line. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, Lower panel shows the 21 omega residual, so that's the signal that they're looking for. The smooth curve shows the residual that would arise from an alpha equals one lambda 80 micron Yukawa interaction. So they can basically say, if there is some new gravitational force, um, this alpha equals one is, means it's equal to the gravitational strength. So alpha is the strength of a new force relative to the strength of gravity. Or the, a change in the inverse square law of gravity that's equal to the strength of gravity at that scale. Um, that, that's two ways of interpreting it. At this separation, so 80 microns is quite a bit below this one millimeter scale by uh, like 10, a factor of 10 basically below the one millimeter scale. Uh, is it 10? No, it's a factor of 100 below the millimeter scale because a millimeter would be a thousand microns and this is basically 100 microns. So that's, wait, hold on, 100 microns. Yeah, so it's basically a factor of 10 below this scale. I said it right the first time. So the fact that this, um, the curve that's shown here is basically, it shows the limits of what they could, what they could get. Um, you could have something roughly gravitational strength down at 80 microns, um, but you do, um, but that's about the best that you could do. And so then uh, you look at the exclusion plot and that's the important thing is this exclusion plot, which is shown right here. This is the thing that makes um, physicists lie awake at night saying, wow, gravity works. Gravity works. Okay, so this, uh, what's shown here is the strength of a new force. This alpha value here, the vertical axis, is the strength of a new force. Let me switch my screen so I can see it a little bit. Okay, so relative to gravity, relative to gravity. So 10 to the zero, that's alpha equals one, means that you have something exactly equal to the gravitational strength um, that is manifest at some length scale. And here's the length scale on this axis. So does it happen on uh, so this is 10 to the minus 2 meters. That would be, uh, what, like a centimeter? So this is like centimeter scales. This is millimeter scales. This is tenth of a millimeter scales. So point, uh, 100 microns. Um, this is one micron down here. Uh, this exclusion limit can go much larger, but they're only interested in this narrow region. Um, you know, you could have, maybe there's a gravitational effect that happens on galactic length scales, and so this would go up to larger sizes. Uh, the constraints are actually better on... Um, solar system scales because we have planets going around the sun we can constrain the effects of gravity in the solar system 
Um, anyways, they're looking at this length scale right here. So this is saying what, what forces could exist or what deviations from known physics could exist relative to gravity on this axis. And notice that these are all, these are factors of 10. Every tick mark is a factor of 10. So here's something equal to gravity, 10 times as strong as gravity, 100 times as strong as gravity, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million times as strong as gravity here. And then you have one one hundredth of the strength of gravity, a thousandth, ten thousandth, and so forth. So the strength of a new force or some phenomena relative to the strength of gravity at a certain length scale. And this is this length scale is determined by how close together they can get these pendulum. All right, now, first thing we want to look at is are there extra spatial dimensions? So the the particle theorists from the early two thousands predicted that if there were two spatial dimensions under certain some kind of thing, it would show up right here at this length scale. So it's roughly a millimeter length scale, it's slightly smaller than a millimeter, so it's what, like half a millimeter length scale. And it would be on the order of gravitational strength, or maybe a little bit more, on the order of gravitational strength because this is gravity after all. And so if there was uh, compactified, two compactified extra spatial dimensions, then it would show up as a deviation from the inverse square law, roughly gravitational strength because it's gravity, um, at roughly a half a millimeter size. And so they made this experiment specifically to see, do we see this? Do we see a deviation from the inverse square law at that length scale? And the answer to that question is, no, they did not. They did not because they exclude, uh, they exclude the yellow part, the yellow region. So this is all stuff that had been excluded before, all the light yellow, and the more prominent yellow, the more saturated yellow, is the new measurement. So they had a 2004 measurement um, which excluded this thing. Now it looks like they only made a little bit of a little slice, but you have to consider the fact that you go straight down. So they excluded this extra spatial dimension thing in 2004 by what it looks like a factor of 10. It looks like a factor of 10, maybe maybe a factor of 20 from here down to that line, because the, the, it's not from here to that line. It's not a diagonal. You go straight down because that's this axis. So the coupling <clears throat> that you could get from some deviation from the inverse square law at that scale is um, you know, a factor of 10 weaker, okay? which means that there's no extra spatial dimensions unless there's something really unusual happening. And then this new measurement that they made with this 21-fold symmetry, as opposed to the one that um, did pop up in the search that I had earlier, this is what, like a factor of 1,000? So here, it, this is roughly there, and this thing, this curve down here is like here. So there's one, two, three. Yeah, so it's a factor of a thousand. So they exclude that by a factor of, like, no extra spatial dimensions, no weird force phenomena that happen because of extra spatial dimensions by a factor of a thousand, 0.1%. So that's pretty good. Uh, that's what they exclude uh, with this, this particular result at 2006. The other thing that we cared about was what about dark energy? So dark energy scale is this 0.1 millimeter scale. And the reason that they switched uh, that they have this new apparatus. So if we look back here, this is their previous apparatus. Uh, open image and new tab. So this was the previous apparatus. Notice that the previous apparatus, it's similar in size. It's kind of got the same idea with holes and, and stuff like that. You have the same pendulum. It's coated. It's metallic so that it conducts away uh, a bunch of stuff. Um, but this one, they couldn't get it quite as close. And here's the turntable with the arrow showing its motion. They couldn't get this one quite as close, and so it had weaker constraints. Um, it had weaker constraints as seen here. Okay, so that's this one. Uh, this this curve, this Etwash 2004. So here's the Etwash 2004 curve. It's going to go like that, and it's going to basically rise up like this. Now the issue is dark energy was discovered in the meantime, so they had to rethink the experiment that they've been designing. How are we going to change this? And they said, we've got to get closer. If we want to probe dark energy, which is at the millimeter scale, we've got to get closer. Um, well, it's like a, a tenth of a millimeter scale, so we've got to get closer. And so, because what they what they can constrain with the previous result, the previous result comes up like this, is they can say that there's no extra force on the dark energy scale that is a thousand times as strong as gravity, right? A thousand times is up here. And that would be basically where this line crosses this the dark energy band. Dark energy scale band is right here. And so they're like, you know, yay, we found that there's no force that's 100 times stronger than gravity. Well, that's, that's not interesting, right? Not discovering a force that's 100 times stronger than gravity when you don't necessarily expect it to be there, not very interesting. 
So they had to redesign the apparatus so that they could take their limit at the dark energy scale. Here's the dark energy scale. There's the limit that they could make and drop it down so that it's below the strength of gravity. So that the, they could constrain additional forces at the dark energy scale that are weaker than gravity. That's what they needed to do. And so uh, that's why this new experiment was designed, new old experiment, right? 2006 is old. Uh, well, old by some standards. It's, and that's why they designed this apparatus with the 21-fold symmetry. And these are the results that they had. And so they were able to eliminate uh, a scalar field with gravitational strength coupling at a millimeter scale as the dark energy. And that is pretty cool. So these, this one torsion pendulum result from a group of a half a dozen scientists, right? Uh, let's look at how many people were on this. Uh, Kapner, Cook, Adelberger, he's the guy that led the group, uh, Gunlock, Heckel, um, Hoyle. So that's what, like, yeah, basically a half a dozen scientists in a laboratory in the Pacific Northwest um, with, a, with a tiny little torsion pendulum suspended by a little fiber. Uh, we're able to eliminate this um, dark energy, basically like a simple interpretation of the dark energy coupling, or the, of the dark energy. So it doesn't mean the dark energy isn't there, it means that it's not a scalar field that operates on length scales relative to the dark energy density, or length scales defined by the dark energy density. Uh, they also have some things in here, these moduli, diloton, radion, those are all uh, predictions to the extent that string theory makes predictions about you know, if we have a string theory model that has certain properties, then we might expect um, new types of particles to have the, roughly this kind of coupling on these different length scales. And so they're eliminating um, some predictions from different additions to the standard model of particle physics. So that was this one. That was 2006. Then they said, we can do better than this. How are they going to do better than this? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because this is their more recent result that I think just came out. Uh, let me hide these thumbnails, shrink this thing down. So this one is a different torsion pendulum. Okay, a lot of the same people, here's Adelberger, uh, here, there's Cook, uh, there's Heckel again, all from the University of Washington, February 2020, so this is like a year old. Okay, this is the new pendulum that they have. So instead of having that 21-fold symmetry, uh, this one's five pages long instead of four pages. Um, so in this case, are we looking for a dark particle or dark energy at the same time? In this case, it was looking for new physics, like whether it's a new force, uh, whether it's a new particle, um, at the scale given by the dark energy density scale. Okay, so this is their apparatus. You can see it's got the same idea, same reflective surfaces here. It's got the same trim masses up here to calibrate it. And yet the surface now, instead of having... 21 holes that are drilled next to each other. It looks like this. Let me zoom in so we can see the amazingness of this thing. This, my friends, is 120 little pie slices. So it's, 100 and, it's 120. And they also have this outer ring that is 18. Right? So there's 18 fold symmetry here. There should be nine little chunks cut out, nine chunks cut out here. They're etched out by some kind of thing. Um, and then the inner one is 120. So in this case, when the turntable is rotating and they're moving these things relative to each other, they're going to get a signal that is going to be 120 times the frequency and a second signal that is 18 times the frequency. And you choose these numbers because you want to eliminate some kind of systematic effects. You want to have the numbers to be relatively prime so that um, interactions at, from one set of effective masses, right, so that you have effective like mass, no mass, mass, no mass, mass, no mass. Um, you want to have that signal to be relatively prime to the signal you'd get from this 120. So that's probably why they chose uh, 18. Because if you did it at like uh, 16, 16 goes into, does 16 go into 120? I think it does. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to have it at 12 because 12 definitely goes into 120. Because then the oscillations, if you see a signal at this frequency here, the frequency of the outer pattern, um, it would bleed into your signal that you might be looking for at the 120 thing. So you want to uh, have these things so that they're you have you know, so they're relatively prime. You have these 18-fold uh, symmetry and 120-fold symmetry, and then uh, they gold plate it. Um, they glue it onto something, and then they gold plate it so that it looks like this. In the end, this is not a photograph. This is actually a uh, computer. 
I, I believe this is a computer model of this thing. Um, the rotation rate of the turntable is a good question. I think it's 15 minutes or something like that. Um, we can see, I'm sure they have the signal. The turntable harmonic. Uh, um, let's see, let's go with frequency. Attractor rotation frequency. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see it in here, but it's fairly slow. Um, 0.01 hertz is like 100 seconds. So, anyways, I can't. Uh, I can't find it right off the bat, but it's in there somewhere. Okay, so that is what they're looking at. And in this case, uh, they, bring, they can bring these things closer together. Part of the reason why you have this really small scale design, so the reason that they shifted to a design that has 120 symmetry instead of a 21, as opposed to uh, 21 that they had on the previous one, is that now these things are a lot closer together. Now the gaps and the, and the material are closer together, what that does is it means that you, as you bring them closer together, the force is going to be stronger because you basically can probe forces at a given scale given by the size of um, the masses that you're using. So you'll get a stronger response if the size of your wedge is comparable to the size of the um, extra dimension that you might be looking for or the new physics that you might be looking for or the length scale that you're probing. So if you have gigantic bowling ball size masses and you're trying to measure something on a millimeter scale, it's going to be hard to resolve. At the same time, if you have something that's like the size of a human hair and you're trying to probe something that's on meter scale, again, the sizes don't match. You're going to get a maximum signal where the, the length scales that you're probing are similar to the size of the masses that you're coupling to. And so that's why they have this, um, they're, they're going to shorter distances and so they needed to have smaller holes, basically. So that is uh, what's going on here is the relative strength that they expect in a torque as a function of separation in millimeters. So you start at one millimeter and you go down to zero millimeters. This is what they're expecting the torque to change from at 120 when you're really widely separated. So when you're when you have these two, the source and the pendulum uh, separated by a millimeter, the 18 fold symmetry is going to have the strongest signal because that is closer to the size that you're looking at. And the 120 fold symmetry is going to have a weaker signal. As you bring them close together, eventually they're going to cross and the 120 one is going to be the one that's most excited because now you're talking, you're talking about forces on smaller scales. So these are the length scales that you're trying to probe to look for new physics and this is why you have, you're have going to get a stronger signal over some length scales and then you're going to at one symmetry, at one multiple, 18, and then you're going to get a stronger signal. Then it's going to transition as you get even closer to where uh, the 120 signal gets bigger. Uh, if it's there, right? This is, if the signal is there, then it will be stronger. Okay, so then they make these measurements. Uh, measurements look like this. These are the uh, turntable harmonics that they're looking for, so they eliminate things um, that line up the way that they don't want them to. This is probably a calibration. It looks like it might be the calibration data that show up in these different spots. I'd, I'd have to read it uh, a bit more carefully. Um, to know what these different peaks correspond to. Uh, but then it shows, you know, basically what their noise is. Now, from this new design, the moral of the story is from the new design, they did not see any new physics. Um, it shows, like, here's the prediction that you get for the different multiples of 18, right? 18, 36, 54, and the 120 multiples at different separations. And they're able to probe to smaller length scales. And so if we look at this exclusion plot, and compare it to the previous one. So they were specifically looking to go to smaller length scales, and so they designed it a little bit differently. They also had the same idea, they had to stretch this copper thing in there. They can measure the separation by looking at the capacitance, the buildup of charge between the two, or how, how a voltage um, would affect the motion. So the 2007 results is the ones that we just looked at, is right here. 
and then they have this 2019 result, so a decade later, it shifts, basically the curve shifts to the left. Uh, it shifts to the left because now they're going basically the same strength, they have the same rough systematic effect, so it doesn't shift down, um, but they're getting to closer distances, and so it shifts to the left. So at a given distance, it does shift down, but the curve itself is moving to the left because their vertical thing is constrained by how well they can control the environment that they're operating in. Um, so anyways, that is their 2019 result. Again, it excludes a bunch of stuff at different length scales, and um, so that, that's how you win this. Some of these other experiments that are run, I don't know what this IUPUI experiment was. I know that for much, much smaller length scales, uh, they will use Casimir forces to constrain it. Um, you know, so we know that if you go down to a nanometer that there isn't a force that is a billion times stronger than gravity, because notice that these, uh, you know, this is a million up here. Um, and that's measured by Casimir forces, like the vacuum fluctuations of the quantum fields at small separations. Uh, I believe that these Stanford results, Stanford 2003, 2005, and 2008, I'm not sure, um, but I'm relatively certain that those are from inter interferometers, like atomic interferometry. So you have a beam of atoms and you shoot them up and you hit them with lasers and then you split the paths that they're following and you're looking for weird gravitational effects that would change the advancement of the phase of the atomic wave function. Um, so you have a fountain of things squirting up and down um, and then you split the path by hitting it with a laser beam, you put it in some kind of superposition state and then they come back down, then you recombine it um, with another pulse of the laser beam, and you get interference effects if there's some weird strength of gravity that changes depending upon the height that these things go. So if um, you have two, I'm, I'm going from memory here and it's been a while, but I think what you do is you send up some rubidium atoms or something like that, you hit it with a laser pulse that you split into some kind of superposition thing depending upon the relative spins, um, and then it comes back down, you hit it with another laser pulse, and then they recombine. And then here's this separation that you get here, and is the gravitational strength really different? Is there some kind of weird interaction between these uh, two beams of something or other? And so I, I don't recall all the details, but it's something like this, where you have, you're have you looking for an interference pattern, because when they recombine, um, you're taking a superposed state and combining it into an original state again. And the, the phase, if there is some new force, then the quantum phases are going to advance at a different rate. Something like that is what's going on. I believe that's what's going on with these Stanford experiments. Uh, and then over here you have just different setups uh, for these different experiments. So that is that. Uh, another thing that I just found out about uh, about two hours ago is that there's apparently a Chinese group that's doing similar result or similar experiments at slightly different length scales. So this is the Chinese experiment. <clears throat> uh, let me get rid of these and scoot this over. Okay, so you can see the same idea of what's the relative strength of a new force relative to gravity and the length scale that you're looking at. And they are probing, again, their focus is on this dark energy scale, um, not on going to shorter distances. So if we flat, flip back and forth between this University of Washington experiment is at basically 10 to the minus five. So they're going to closer distances. So they're pushing the curve to the left. Uh, closer distances, this is 10 to the minus five, between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus five meters is where they are most sensitive, right? This is in meters. Uh, and if you switch to this one, this one is centered at 10 to the minus four. So the Washington experiment is gonna be over here. And this Chinese experiment is right here, pushing down on, um, like dropping down the sensitivity. Basically they can control their systematic effects better than the University of Washington group did. Um, so, and the way that they did it is actually interesting. I had never seen something set up quite like this. Uh, so here's their apparatus. Um, they have a torsion balance. I'll zoom in a little bit on it. So here's their torsion balance. It's suspended by a fiber. Um, they have this magnetic damper. So if there's also if the fiber starts to vibrate, you have a little magnetic disc. It's actually a non-magnetic disc with a magnet surrounding it, so that the disc is sloshing around in the magnetic field that creates eddy currents in it that dissipates the energy by heating up the, the thing. So this is probably like an aluminum disc. Um, and then they have their attractor is, again, it's a turntable, but it's a turntable that's horizontal. So they have this horizontal turntable with these wedges basically in it. And then their pendulum is suspended by it. So here is, here's their turntable like this. And then they have a pendulum that's suspended this way. 
with large masses on either side. So it's like a dumbbell style mass. And then as this thing rotates, then they're going to get their pendulum is going to deflect as the masses pass by. Um, and then they have these capacitive actuators. I'm not totally sure what those are for. Um, they have uh, their auto collimator, so that's like a laser beam. And then they have this gravitational calibration out here where they can spin this thing. Um, and as it spins to one side, it's going to attract one side more strongly than the other. And then they spin it over here, and then it's going to attract that side more strongly. So they can oscillate this thing at a calibration frequency, have their pendulum um, swinging in like at this at this calibration frequency, and then have this thing rotating at a signal frequency that they're looking for. So that's kind of an interesting setup. Similar idea, certainly a similar technology in terms of it's a torsion pendulum. Uh, similar idea of having a turntable, but now they're getting to, uh, they can control the systematic effects because, you know, whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I don't know the details of their design, but it, it was interesting to see something suspended from a slightly different direction. So the moral of the story is, if you want to look for weird gravitational strength couplings, like new spatial dimensions, if you want to look for dark energy in a laboratory, that kind of stuff, these are the kinds of devices that you have. And I'm going to show, I'm going to pull back up the uh, University of Washington experiment. Uh, this one, so this is their most recent results. But they exclude the extra dimensions. They ha had excluded them 20 years earlier uh, with this experiment. Two extra spatial dimensions. There might be more. If you have a third extra spatial dimension, then this like expected signal region drops way, way down. Um, and it's much, much harder to find. But two extra spatial dimensions up here. One extra spatial dimension, you get a signal that's way up here that's been excluded by a factor of a million. This one had not been excluded until the 2004 results. And then, so if you have a different number of spatial dimensions and that affects the gravitational field in a different way uh, that was not sensitive, that this particular experiment was not sensitive to, um, but they were able to exclude new physics at the dark energy scale in 2006, improve upon it at shorter distances down here. Um, and then you have uh, again, this Chinese experiment that was able to, again, also make improvements in these measurements. So that's an interesting thing to consider, that you're looking for really unusual spatial physics. You know, is the geometry of the universe different at short distances? Um, is there some new physics interaction that might be related to string theory uh, from these kinds of apparatus that you can build in a laboratory on a tabletop um, or the Etwash group has probably had, I don't know, they just won a $3 million prize for their work. Uh, but, you know, they probably have had on the order of $500,000 a year for the last 20 years. And these are, these are some major, in cosmology, these kinds of results, especially like string, string cosmology and also particle physics cosmology, uh, these kinds of results have important implications for what theories are viable and which ones aren't. They exclude all sorts of crazy theories that the theorists would otherwise come up with. So it's a really quite a prolific group. They have another, a number of other measurements that they've made using similar apparatus for like spin dependent forces and axions and things like that. But that's for another time. So that, there you go. That is um, how you can constrain the presence of additional spatial dimensions using laboratory handheld, well, it's, you don't hold it in your hand, but you could hold it in your hand, uh, experimental devices. Does anybody have any questions?